have a distinguished panel with us here today uh, to help us uh, discuss and explore what is gender-based violence. We want to explore not only what it is, but look at its prevalence, its causes, and in developing a shared understanding so that we can not only respond appropriately, but also ultimately prevent violence against women and their children. Um, our four speakers, and I'll just uh, briefly read um, their, their bios, so I'll do that and then I'll invite each speaker to, uh, to talk to us for about five minutes about um, their, their views on what gender-based violence is. Um, our first speaker is Lisette Ahrens. Um, Lisette is the assistant director, is an assistant director in the ABS, Australian Bureau of Statistics, National Centre for Crime and Justice Statistics. Lizette's a criminologist and survey methodologist, and she is responsible for the analysis and dissemination of Australian crime and safety survey data, including the personal safety survey. These collections provide information about the prevalence and characteristics of people's experiences as victims of household and personal crimes. A key part of her role is to assist researchers to understand and interpret crime statistics. The National Centre for Crime and Justice Statistics also produces administrative data on crime from the police, criminal courts and corrections and agencies in each state and territory. Um, Fiona McCormack uh, on the far right is the CEO of Domestic Violence Victoria, the peak body for family violence services for women and children in Victoria. DV Vic provides political advocacy on behalf of and in partnership with its member organisations for violence prevention, systemic change and enhancement of systems. This includes broader representation on groups including the Ministerial Advisory Co Group on Addressing Violence Against Women, the Ministerial Advisory Committee on Homelessness and the National Plan Implementation Panel. Jody Martin is the CEO at Gippsland Women's Health. She has over 15 years experience in the health and human services sector, having worked in community health and local government prior to working in women's health. Jody currently chairs the Gippsland Prevention of Men's Violence Against Women Strategy Steering Committee and the Gippsland Integrated Family Violence Steering Committee. She has a particular passion for improving access to health education and services for young people in rural areas. And finally, Cam Davis has been a member of Victoria Police for 24 years. He has been recognised as a specialist in the sexual crime and family violence crime areas. He is currently the officer in charge of the Box Hill Sexual Offence and Child Abuse Investigation Team, managing a team of 23 um, sexual assault investigators. He has performed previous roles at the Family Violence Coordination Unit, formerly known as the Violence Against Women and Children Strategy Group, Sexual Crime Squad, and he was also the team leader of the Internet Child Exploitation Team. He's an active White Ribbon Ambassador, having spoken at a number of public forums about family violence and violence against women. And he is also a member of No to Violence and believes engaging men is crucial to reducing violence against women. So it's a pretty impressive panel um, and uh, I thank them for coming along today. Um, firstly, I'd like to um, ask Lisette to come and um, present. Uh, Lisette is going to uh, talk to us about the personal safety survey. So please welcome Lisette. the opportunity today to present um, to you. I'm going to provide a brief summary of what the Personal Safety Survey 2012 tells us about the levels and gender nature of violence experienced by men and women in Australia. The Australian Bureau of Statistics Personal Safety Survey defines violence as being physical and sexual assault or the threat of these. The Personal Safety Survey also included a measure of emotional abuse which is defined as psychological, social, economic and verbal abuse. From the Personal Safety Survey, we know that many Australians have experienced violence at some point in their lives. Since the age of 15, 
almost one in three women have experienced physical violence. One in four women have experienced emotional abuse by a partner. One in five have experienced sexual violence. And one in six have experienced physical or sexual violence by a partner. For men, one in every two and a half have experienced physical violence. One in seven have experienced emotional abuse by a partner. One in 19 have experienced violence by a partner. And one in 22 have experienced sexual violence. The statistics also show that the nature of men's and women's experience of violence differs considerably. All the comparisons I'll talk about from now are statistically significant. The types of violence experienced by men and women differs. Whilst men were more likely than women to experience violence overall and more likely to experience physical violence in the 12 months prior to the interview, women were more likely to experience sexual violence as well as being more likely to experience emotional abuse by a partner. Substantial numbers of women across Australia experienced violence in the last 12 months prior to interview, with nearly half a million women aged 18 and over experiencing physical violence and a further 100,000 women experiencing sexual violence. Whilst the prevalence of physical violence experienced by men decreased between 2005 and 2012, the prevalence rates for women experiencing both physical and sexual violence were similar in those periods. The relationship to the perpetrator of violence also differs between men and women who experience violence. Women aged 18 years and over were more likely to have experienced violence in the last 12 months by a known person than by a stranger, whereas for men, the reverse was true. Both men and women experienced violence by a known person at similar rates in, in the last 12 months. However, for women, that known person was more likely to be a partner than for men. One and a half percent of all women <clears throat> experienced violence by a current or previous partner in the last 12 months, and that's over 132,000 women. Taking a closer look at partner violence, we can see here that over their lifetime, women were more likely than men to experience violence by a partner since the age of 15. The experience of partner violence in Australia is all too common as those present today would know. Nearly one and a half million women and half a million men have experienced violence by a current or previous partner in their lifetime. The survey also found that there's been, there was no change since the 2005 survey in the proportion of men or women who reported experiencing partner violence in the 12 months prior to interview. Some further analysis of the personal safety survey data has found that emotional abuse is an important in the context for par of partner violence. One third of women and one fifth of men who experienced emotional abuse by their current partner also experienced physical or sexual violence by that partner. In contrast, of those who had never experienced emotional abuse by a partner, just over 1% of women and 1.5% of men had experienced violence by their partner. Whilst the Personal Safety Survey did not explicitly measure the number of children who are impacted by violence, the data does suggest that substantial numbers of children witness violence by um, witness partner violence. It was estimated that some 570,000 women had at least one child in their care at the time they experienced violence by a male previous partner and that the child or children had seen or heard the violence. In addition, almost 75,000 women had a child or children in their care um, at the time they experienced violence by their current partner. The location where men and women experience violence also differs. Women were more likely than men to have experienced physical assault by a male in their home. And for women, the ho their home was the most common location in which they experienced physical assault by a male. In contrast, men were more likely than women to have experienced physical assault by a male at a place of entertainment or recreation or at an outside location. So 
So that's a very brief snapshot of what we know about the experiences of violence in Australia from the Personal Safety Survey. As you can see here, the Personal Safety Survey covers a broad range of information about violence. It's a very rich data source, and I'd encourage you to explore the, pub the publication or the microdata file and the user guide by visiting the ABS website. Um, and for more information, you can contact ABS Information Consultancy through the website or um, contact, you can email me, I think the details are in the conference guide. Thank you. Thanks, Lisette. Um, and uh, just to get the um, discussion on, underway, um, I'll just read out a quote from Chief Commissioner Ken Lay. Um, Ken said that half of our assaults this year were in the home. That gives you a sense of the problem. You know, we'll talk at the community discussions, the media discussions about how unsafe the streets are and licensed premises and the like. But when you actually look at the data, the most significant problem is in the home. By far, the vast proportion of our assaults is men bashing women. So, I mean, that, that's just one statement, and I also think that Lisette, you know, gave a good overview of what um, what the what the survey personal safety sa uh, sorry personal safety survey revealed. Um, perhaps uh, I'll start with you, Jody, if you could um, address, I guess, what you what you believe gender based violence to be, and uh, yeah, thanks. help turning the mic <laughs> Okay, we'll get there in the end. Um, yeah, the quote from Ken Lay um, only touches on uh, assault or physical violence and as Lizette um, mentioned in her presentation, we need to look at the more broader picture, so yes, Physical assault is an awful factor of family violence, but uh, there are also the issues of emotional abuse and economic abuse, which can be equally as crippling um, to women and their children and their families. Um, I think also the quote that um, Ken made there is also only looking at family violence that's been reported to police. So they're the incidences that we know about. Um, so I guess the scary thing is that there's probably a whole raft of other um, types of family violence, including physical assault, that's going on that's unreported. So I think that's a scary picture for what the true um, incidence of violence probably is. Uh, Amanda mentioned earlier in her um, welcome this morning around um, there's some community perception that men can't control themselves and that that leads them to commit acts of violence against their partners and families. I think what we need to be clear about at this conference is that uh, the, uh, the issue of violence against women is an issue of power and control. Men can control their violence. These are men that go to work, they uh, participate in the community, they play sport, and they can do all of this without perpetrating violence to other people in the community. So I think we need to be really clear that these men are making a choice to perpetrate violence. It's not something they have no control over. Um, and a lot of that power and, power and control is often linked to rigidly defined um, gender roles, so what it means to be masculine or feminine, and for a lot of these men, um, being masculine is about having control over their partner. <coughs> which links to things like um, financial abuse, which we don't hear a lot about, but often it's around limiting um, control of, um, or access to money in the family, or giving a woman an inadequate allowance for her to go and do the weekly shopping, um, often men will put the bills in the female partner's name, which means that if she ever leaves, she's responsible for a debt, and if she's not allowed to work, um, that can create all sorts of issues for her if she tries to leave in the future, or often she won't leave because financially it's just not an option for her, and we do know that a huge rate of um, homelessness is attributed to family violence. Um, for me, working in a rural setting in Gippsland and knowing that, you know, in a lot of Mar Mallee area, there's a lot of um, 
quite isolated areas as well. I think one thing we need to consider is women in rural areas are quite often um, at higher risk of violence too, and that can be related to um, their isolation, both socially and physically, from services. Um, there's a lot of small towns that don't have access to things like 24-hour police stations. So for those women, that might be in family violence situations, there's not always access to services and certainly not always access um, to emergency response when that's needed. Uh, and something that was touched on earlier this morning is it's also difficult for a woman in a rural area because often their partner is a well-known community member um, held in high esteem and people just would not believe that that man is capable of committing violence against his partner. So there's some of the things I think we need to consider today, given that we're looking at work, particularly in the Lod and Mallee area, is the impact that rurality has on women experiencing violence. And that's it for me. Good, thank you. Ken? Good morning and um, thank you. Um, there's just three brief areas that I just uh, would like to touch on. So um, frequency is is one of them. So in the last uh, 10 or 12 years, Victoria Police have really worked very hard and strengthened uh, their policies and systems in regards to reporting of family violence. And what that has given us is a pretty clear picture that we have a significant uh, community problem. Um, but I still believe that the reporting rates of family violence and intimate partner violence is um, very much still underreported. So Victoria Police uh, primarily are involved in the response to family violence and intimate partner violence. So I appreciate that this conference is a, mainly about prevention, but um, Victoria Police have a significant role to play in the response to family violence and intimate partner violence. The second point is the complexity of, of this topic. So. Drawing on my 24 years experience of investigating sexual crimes and, and intimate partner violence, um, we talk about power, control and entitlement. Um, and Jody made some good comments about what, what does violence look like? And I, and I see it as a, as a continuum. So you have some subtle violence as well as going to the other end of the continuum where you have intimate partner homicide. So I'd like to also sell you the story about the whole story. So um, in sexual assault investigations and what we're now seeing with family violence and intimate partner violence investigations, criminal investigations, we're talking about the whole story. So it's not talking about the isolated incident which involves violence, it's about what else is happening in the relationship. This is a relationship crime. And my last point is the responsibility and accountability. So we've heard some statistics today and Victoria Police's own statistics would tell us that uh, yes, there is uh, violence committed against men in our community, but overwhelmingly uh, men commit violence against women uh, in most um, occasions. So um, men need to be held accountable. How do we do that? There's a number of ways that we ho hold them ac uh, accountable. In Victoria Police's point of view, we have um, the code of practice for the investigation of family violence. We have criminal action. We have civil action as well as referring not only victims of family violence and intimate partner violence, but also perpetrators to support agencies. It's interesting that um, in my role I attend a lot of conferences and just a quick scan of the audience this morning is a majority of women are here. So where are the men? With all due respect to the men in the, uh, in the audience, we need to have more men here listening to the stories of in intimate partner violence. We need them. Thanks, Cam. Fiona? So, 
I worked out the trick and then I can't work it anymore. <coughs> Is that on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, look, I don't want to kind of go on and uh, say all the things that have already been said, and um, particularly after we've heard from Clem, because what a shame she's not an expert in this area, hey? <laughs> For those of us who do work in this area, wow, what a fantastic education. Uh, exactly about um, violence against women. And I do want to say, often when we talk about violence against women or gender-based violence, the automatic assumption is we're talking about family violence. And as, as Cam's just said, you know, we're talking about a continuum of violence, but a continuum of violence across women's lives. Um, I recently became a grandmother, which, you know, I pretty much say at the beginning of every meeting, you know, it's, it's I should have worn a t-shirt, I don't know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited. But it's a little girl, so I've only got sons, and it just terrifies me to think uh, that the most significant contributing risk factor to her life, her, her, um, her well-being in Victoria in 2014, with everything that we've got in terms of education and health, is violence. And um, that's not because of any sort of physiological attribute of hers. And I think, you know, that's part of the, the problem is that we've, um, despite us being such a, a well-educated community and having access to information, you know, on such a regular basis, our understanding about the causes is so limited. And so people often think it's just about saying, violence against women, it's a terrible thing, we don't condone it, and then are oblivious to the ways in which they support the conditions that allows violence against women by the way in which they speak about women, by the way in which they interact with women, by sexist language, by, by jokes, um, and also by the way in which they operate in the world. As, as um, you know, we've heard today, we've got a lot of men in positions of power, We've got, you know, inequity uh, between men and women. No better example of that is in our federal government and cabinet right now. Um, and, and what that means is that we've got um, a, a gender inequity at a range of different sites and, and the, the way in which violence against women plays out is essential, essentially a reflection of that gender imbalance. When we look at women from non-English speaking backgrounds, uh, Aboriginal women, women with disabilities who experience much higher rates of violence um, because of vulnerabilities other than gender, uh, it gives us an indication about the impact of gender, about the way in which um, we um, stereotype about what it is uh, to be a man, what it is to be a woman, but also in terms of the inequities in relation to the way in which um, uh, women can actually seek support or get any sort of redress in the justice system, the likelihood it is uh, that there will be any kind of justice for her. I'm sorry, I really feel like I'm rambling. Um, so, look, the, I, I guess to sum it up, my, for, for me, gender imbalance is, is caused by um, uh, the inequities between men and women, um, the structural inequities, our attitudes that excuse and blame, and it's attitudes to uh, violence when it's already occurred, and it's attitudes to um, uh, violence uh, to women in general. Um, and, uh, and the status of women. We need to ensure that women um, have access to um, opportunities for redress uh, in order to make them less vulnerable. So, sorry, I, I do feel like I've raved. Thanks, Fiona. So I guess what we've, uh, what I've heard um, some of the panelists talk about is um, the links between uh, violence against women and gender inequality. Fiona, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about what what are we talking about when we're talking about gender equality? I mean, you know, don't yeah. we have it all, women? I'm sure okay. we do. So um, I think sometimes when women's groups call for equal numbers of women in parliament or equal numbers of women on boards. Um, equal pay, which I think there's still a gap of 14%, isn't there? Th growing, terrific. Um, people think that it's equity just for uh, parity's sake, uh, but 
uh, obviously the research shows that um, there's a connection between this and rates of violence that women experience for a couple of reasons. One is when you have women in positions of power, um, first of all, it breaks down stereotypes, of, uh, those gender stereotypes. Um, because uh, we're talking about sexism. If we can strike at the heart of um, sexism, we can really strike at the heart of violence against women. Um, so having women in positions of power as a you know everyday thing is, is really, really important. Um, and uh, also because it means that women have uh, options. So as I was saying before, so you know, women who experience uh, violence, say family violence, um, will uh, often experience it um, in terms of physical violence when they're pregnant with their first child because it's much more difficult for them to leave at that time uh, because they're financially dependent upon their partner, because that's the time when they're most vulnerable, they need a roof over their head. And men who choose to use violence prey on this fact. They prey on the vulnerabilities of uh, whether they're likely to be caught and whether women uh, have options. So um, it's really, really important that we have Gender equity, is that what you, what was the question, Margaret? Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. Um, Why do we need it and what is it? And what is it, mm. yep. Yeah. Can I just comment on that too? Because Fiona's touched on all the big picture things which are absolutely crucial, but I think it's a lot more subtle than that too. There's a great YouTube clip that one of my staff members, Tanya, sent around the office a while back um, about a Like a Girl campaign. And I'm not sure whether people have seen it, but it's interviewing children and adults and asking them to throw like a girl or run like a girl. And nearly everyone in the clip, you know, did the, the limp wrist and this weird little run. Um, and it's subtle things where people just think that women are less than everyone else and we're not strong enough and we can't run strongly. And it wasn't until they had those conversations in the video and then they said, let's do it again. Show me how to run like a girl. And the children started running strongly. So it's really subtle and it starts that way and builds to the bigger things like pay equity and childcare and all of those things. Carers. Carers, yeah. Sexual. Caring roles, yeah. Sexual. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's right, we could, get, we could go on. Yeah. Thanks. Um, we know that the biggest risk factor um, for women in the world is their gender around violence. Um, we know that violence against women costs the Australian economy something like around 14 billion a year and growing. Are we investing enough in responding to and preventing violence against women? Do we need to be doing more? Can we do more? Is this a lost cause? Do we just have to put up with it? Um, I guess when you see the um, mobilisation of resources and political will around uh, terrorism, um, and when you compare the likelihood of um, uh, an Australian being a victim of a terrorist attack compared to, you know, we keep citing the, uh, a woman murdered uh, across Australia every week. Um, in Victoria, we've had 29 women and eight children. That was just last year. That's not counting all the murders of children and women we've seen this year. Um, and, you know, we keep hearing in the media commentators, um, uh, activists um, uh, from women's sectors about saying that um, if this was an issue in any other, if this was happening on public transport, if if we were seeing police officers being murdered at these rates, if we were seeing um, anybody in any other sphere, it would be worked on. And I think there's a sense of oh, it's, it, it'll, it'll always be with us, you know, a little bit like the poor, it'll, they'll always be with us. But I think um, uh, it is actually uh, doable. We, we can actually do this. Uh, I think our watch, the, the new uh, primary prevention uh, foundation, will be really critical to building capacity across Australia um, uh, to, to lead the, the, the work of primary prevention efforts and setting standards and consistency around this work. Um, but we definitely need more resources. Um, it's, there's, it's obscene how little is invested uh, in this area compared to the issue. And I put it purely down to the lack of concern that this is happening, um, the, the lack of political will. Just from a Victoria Police point of view and drawing on 24 years of my experience 
as I said earlier, in the last 10 or 12 years, Victoria Police have seen a significant change in our culture and approach to, to family violence and intimate partner violence. So presently, we have um, across the state 27 um, specialist sexual assault and child abuse investigation teams, as well as 27 family violence teams who are all um, specialised in um, the response to family violence, but also with an aim to reduce recidivism. Um, as well as we have um, uh, family violence advisors and family violence liaison officers and also family violence court liaison officers. So Victoria Police um, have um, changed the way that we operate um, significantly in the last 10 or 12 years. And, um, and I would say that was well, it's primarily uh, due to the leadership of um, present Chief Commissioners and past. Thank you. How does media reporting impact on our understanding of violence against women and how do we uh, influence or change how media re reports and responds to issues? I mean, we heard Clementine talking about, um, you know, the awful coverage um, of just a few days ago. Um, what, what can we do differently? How, and how does media impact on communities' understanding? Um, I think... Uh, Clem's critique of some of the pieces um, was really spot on uh, earlier. And I think I, I, um, I saw a, uh, just in relation to that, that murder and uh, the murder uh, of a woman and three children and, and the suicide in New South Wales and the way in which that was represented. Um, I've spoken with some journalists in relation to that and the, the feedback that I got was pretty much along the lines of what Clem was talking about, about, well, you know, but it goes to show how this is really confusing. This is, you know, a, he seemed to be a really, really lovely guy. Um, and my response was that we just need to be aware then that that's actually what shapes the community's understanding about what's happened. And I, I heard um, Professor, Professor Cathy Humphreys talking recently about the contagion effect um, that we have in relation to uh, suicide. You know, somebody commits suicide and it sets off a spate. And she was saying, she was posing the, the possibility that what we're actually seeing is a contagion effect of um, men who are choosing to kill themselves but wiping out their family first, and often in the context of when a woman's going to leave or as punishment or revenge. Um, so uh, the media plays such an important part in actually um, shaping attitudes. And it's not just about violence. It's about the way in which women are portrayed. It's around critiques of how we um, treat women about uh, attitudes towards women that are perpetuated. And Victoria has actually done some incredible work mm. in the last eight years in building capacity um, for the media to better report um, that I'll be presenting on after the break in room something. Um, uh, we really need to partner with them because I think the attitudes in the past, our attitudes have been what we just need to do is flog media over the head or, or um, you know, they need to do their, bed job, their job better. We actually need to play a role in providing them uh, with the materials that they need to do their job better. Mm -hmm. um, and that's some of the work that's, uh, in, that we've uh, enacted. Um, Jodie, I'm wondering, um, you know, from a service delivery perspective, I mean, you're from the Women's Health Service, and uh, uh, I'm just wondering if you can tell us, you know, a little bit about what, you, what some of the impacts of violence against women are, and um, I guess some of the myths around women's experience of violence. Sure, I guess a big one, and we hear it over and over again, um, well, we tend to in the work we do, I'm not sure so much broadly in the community, but it's why doesn't the woman leave? You know, why doesn't she just get up and leave? And there's so many factors around why women don't leave. And um, a big one, and it's already been spoken about today, is that a woman is most at risk of being seriously harmed or killed when she tries to leave a partner. So these women are living in circumstances where they are so fearful for their safety 
or for the safety of their children. And more and more we're seeing um, instances of where pets are being used to keep women in the home. So a woman won't leave because her dog or her cat is going to be killed or harmed in some way. So women stay for you know, legitimate reasons, um, particularly in, when you're looking at instances of financial and emotional abuse. It's often because um, they've been so beaten down emotionally that they just don't think they're capable of leaving. They don't have the skills or they don't think they have the skills to leave and they just don't know how to go about it. Um, and financially, if they've got no access to um, economic resources, how do they leave? Um, how do they take their children? Where do they go? Where do they live? And homelessness is a real risk for these women as well. So I guess that's one of the biggest myths is why don't they leave? And we, you know, there are real reasons why, why they don't. Um, does that answer that question? Yeah. Um, is that on? No. Yes. Um, I just wanted to add to what Jody said there, the, um, about that um, women experiencing fear being one of the factors. Um, the Personal Safety Survey 2012 for the first time included some more detailed information around emotional abuse um, experienced by partners and um, one of the key differences that we found um, in analysing that data was that women were more likely than men, um, well, both men and women experienced emotional abuse by um, partners, uh, women were more likely than men to experience anxiety and fear as a result of um, those emotionally abusive behaviours and again in terms of the types of behaviours that um, the people experienced, um, there were some smaller gender differences around the type, specific types of controlling behaviours that men and women experienced. But the really big difference, um, to my mind, was that found that women were three times more likely than men to experience threatening behaviours, um, in particular threats to harm their children, their friends and family or their pets. Mm -hmm. We know that violence against women or gender-based violence is more than just physical uh, or intimate partner violence. How well as a community do you think we understand um, the broader forms of violence against women? Um, a, a lot of the times when I'm going out and about, people are often only talking about family violence or sexual assault. Um, do you think we know more uh, enough about all forms of violence against women and who experiences it the most and what the, the risk factors are for women? I don't think the community does. I think when you talk about family violence, people assume you're talking about physical violence. Um, and so I think there's a lot of work around broadening that understanding and talking about the impacts of the other types of violence on families and women in particular. Um, and you know, there's such a huge range, you know, the stuff Clementine was talking about, even more broadly outside of families, just sexism and sexist behaviour and jokes and all that sort of stuff. Um, it is a form of violence against women and it leads to broader um, issues. And look, I, I think we've got a long, long way to go for the community to understand that. Um, there's so much backlash when we do try and stand up um, to some of those behaviours and comments. And we've got a, an instance happening in our workplace at the moment where we're stood up against a strip night event in the community and we're copying a lot of backlash. So I think, you know, there's a long, long way to go um, for the community to get on the same page. Yeah, mm, a lot of work to be done. Yeah, uh, the whole focus of this conference is around prevention, and I guess uh, I know that we'll touch on, uh, you know, what prevention strategies can be used to address violence against women. But I'm just wondering, from your perspective, how do we actually engage the whole community in responding to violence against women? You know, I, I think there's sometimes a, a bit of a view in the community that we're making a big deal out of nothing. This is just a, you know, a bit of a family squabble or, or you know, you know, it doesn't require a community response. How do we actually engage the community and get them to understand? Look, I think it takes a lot of time and it's baby steps. Um, like the Lot and Mallee area, we've got a regional prevention of violence against women strategy and you know the work we're doing now we wouldn't have even been able to do I would say two or three years ago it has really been um, look I think a lot of it has been around the increased media coverage of issues um, like Rosie Batty's who you're going to hear from um, at the conference and it's just that growing awareness and it's about going out and talking to people and for us a lot of it's just saying particularly when we're talking to males put yourself in this position, how would you feel? And it's, it's really basic stuff. If your daughter, granddaughter, 
sister, mother, da 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 da, if this was happening to her. And sometimes it's a light bulb moment for those men, and they never considered it before. And it's not until you frame it that way that they, that they can actually personalise it. And I have to say the other thing is the stats. You know, they're horrific stats and um, people often have never heard them before. So it's about going out again and saying this is the reality, this is the picture that one woman a week is being killed. Um, and it's, you know, using the shock factor, but sometimes that's what it takes to get some buy-in and certainly for our region that's how we've done it. It's been a lot of going out, having conversations, this is the picture, and um, getting it out word of mouth that way. Yeah, you said you wanted to... Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. Um, thanks for the stats plug. Um, but I think, I mean, national surveys like the Personal Safety Survey are an excellent source of information, but they're na they are national in focus. Um, and we know that, um, I guess, a lot of information around, um, you know, there's a lot of agencies working, providing a lot of programs and support um, to people who've experienced violence. But what we don't have is information about um, the details of those programs um, as a whole, the effectiveness and um, and some of the work the ABS has been doing with the Department, Commonwealth Department of um, Social Services is um, um, we've got three publications that um, are available, some, there's some hard copies available out the front, but putting together um, some structure and I guess conceptual frameworks and an articulation of the information that we do have and the information that we don't have and where those priority information needs are. And a lot of, um, a lot of that information is, um, would come from um, service providers and agencies using the information that they do have as part of their business um, in a statistical way. And sometimes, particularly in a regional area, that can be really, really valuable. Um, a national survey can't give information, quality information about a small area but people working in that area are the ones that hold that information. So there's some guidelines around how to use that information and turn it into, I guess, from, from personal and case type information into um, usable statistical information. And that can be really powerful in um, approaching government and approach, you know, grant applications um, and advocacy work. Um, as a committed and very proud White Ribbon ambassador, uh, we need to engage men uh, more in this conversation. So non-violent men need to engage violent men in conversation about their uh, abusive culture and attitudes. Um, we can't remain silent on this topic. Um, um, I think we need to get smarter about our approach to prevention. Um, so uh, what we have is we've got a lot of knowledge within a range of different NGOs about the causes of violence against women. Um, what we need is a better approach to the way in which we, uh, well, a better approach to understanding a framework for preventing violence against women. So when we had the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women come to visit Australia a couple of years ago, she said that UN women had just done some research on where in the country, where in the world a country was preventing violence against women, and it identified that there's pretty much no countries um, that either uh, efforts are uh, about responding to violence once they've already happened, programmatic responses, uh, or their awareness raising activities. And I think what we've got is a lot of funding into um, a range of different activities. Um, some would fit in the primary prevention box, a lot would fit into uh, awareness raising, but also they're not necessarily coordinated. We've got a range of different prevention or, or different initiatives, activities, but we're not working towards one common objective. We're not leveraging our efforts across, across one another. They're not meeting consistent standards and they're not being informed by a particular framework. So I think the, the framework that was developed um, by Vic Health for the previous Victorian government was monumental in, in just articulating if we were going to approach primary prevention, what would that look like? And it would look like engaging with me and it would look like um, engaging in the media, um, schools, education for, for kids in schools, faith groups, working, pl 
working groups. But within that, we need strategies um, to uh, articulate a vision for that work. Um, and we need to be working collaboratively um, in joining our efforts uh, towards the one objectives, uh, well, objectives under each of those different um, areas, uh, whereby we can then evaluate the effectiveness. I think. Um, we can't just assume, oh, we can prevent by having a, you know, a, a campaign on this or, or that. And, you know, we've had, um, often people think it's just a media a campaign, a media campaign. Um, a couple of years ago, we had two media campaigns, national media campaigns that were launched in Australia on the same day. Neither of them knew about one another, and we didn't know about them. Each of them had different messages. Um, so we've really got to be working much better. And that's, I guess, our watch, the role of our watch will be really important mm -hmm. in corralling efforts towards um, common objectives. Good, thank you. Um, Jody, just quickly one comment. Point. I'd argue that we're getting better at that, though. I know for a fact that there's regional um, prevention strategies being developed right across the state, and there's a number of communities of practice that are developing out of that. I think there's two, or if not three. So I think we're getting better. I agree. In the past, it's been quite sporadic in little bits and pieces, but I think we're starting to come together, and um, hopefully, at some point, and particularly with the foundation, we'll get a broader state um, focus coming out from that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just to finish up, I mean, I think I think it's clear that when we're talking about gender-based violence, we're talking about um, all forms of violence against women, and I think the panelists have really um, touched on that. We've also heard um, the links between gender inequality and violence against women, and if we're going to be serious about addressing uh, violence against women, then we must also address uh, issues of gender equality. And I guess you know one of the things that we do need to do is we do need to put this out there that this is also linked to concepts of male privilege and entitlement, and uh, and the concept of giving up power, I think, is a very, very um, uh, powerful one. And uh, certainly in the work that we do uh, in my organisation with men who use violence, uh, you know, when you talk about this concept of giving up power, uh, there is a very sense, uh, a very strong sense of discomfort in the room. And, um, and I think it's one that we do need to ask each and every man in this room uh, and in our community. It's not just about men who use violence, it's about men in general uh, and concepts of male privilege and entitlement that as a community we actually have to address if we're serious about responding to and preventing uh, violence against women. Um, so we've reached the end of our time. Please join me in thanking Fiona, Cam, Jodie and Lisette for a great panel discussion. Thank you. <laughs>